Colossians chapter 3, and I'd like to try and cover verses 5 through 14. Start reading in verse 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and freemen, but Christ is all in all. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Father, I ask that you would take these words this morning. Make these words alive by the Spirit. Speak to us individually in ways that only we can hear. Teach us from your word how it is that we're living and how it is you want us to live. And teach us what it is to have this godly love that you describe for us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've been with us or if you've been following online, uh, in chapters 1 and 2 of Colossians, uh, the Apostle Paul sent up, spent a lot of time setting up biblical doctrine. And like a good teacher, Paul reestablished for this church the truth claims of God and set these up as foundational for Christians. Paul had to remind these churchgoers of the absolute truths of the Bible because false ideas, false practices, man-made laws and religion had crept into their church and were leading them away from the true freedom in Christ. Well, now in chapter 3, Paul changes from teaching Christian doctrine to teaching about Christian living. The difference between what you believe and what you actually do. You see, if a follower of Christ must first believe the right things and then must live according to those beliefs. The Bible will state over and over that our actions, our thoughts, our words come from our deepest beliefs. Out of the heart is where the words come from. We cannot say, for instance, that we have right beliefs about God when our lives demonstrate that we actually trample the love of Jesus Christ. For instance, if you notice yourself Always eyeing your neighbor's boat or their house because it's bigger or their health because they're more healthy. Or maybe you're always, your ears are always looking for the next piece of gossip that you can gently spread around. Or something inside you seems always bent on looking for ways to make yourself look good and others not so good. These are the things that can't both be true of a Christian. In verse 5, Paul says, Therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead 
immorality, impurity, passions, evil desire, and greed, which Paul says is tantamount to idolatry. Seems surprising. Paul says, therefore, and we might say, since then. Right? The, the typical adage is, if you see therefore, it's there for a reason. It's there for something before. You might just say, since then. Well, since the truths that he established in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 3, since these are true of Christ's followers, since we have been raised with Christ and we are redeemed from our previous sinful life, since our previous self-seeking life and pride has been buried with Christ and raised to life, since the Holy Spirit has given us a new spiritual life, then, he goes on to say, then you and I must treat as dead a series of sins that he now lists. Well, dead things, as far as I know, don't have any impact on living things anymore. Right? Genghis Khan. Remember who he was? Head of the Mongolian Empire. Right, all kinds of uh, emperors that are gone, that can't affect us anymore. Is that correct? Right. It doesn't matter if it's Stalin or Lenin or Hitler, they're gone. They can no longer affect us. In this sense, that previous life that we had, that sinful life in opposition to God, is gone and is not to affect us anymore. We're not to ponder and to dream about uh, sexual sin here. He calls it immorality, and it covers a, an entire range of things. A Christian should not, for instance, have pictures and pinups of mostly naked women in their garage or man cave. You laugh. You'd be surprised what pastors see. And there's no use pretending, if you're a guy here this morning, I can say this to you because I'm a guy. There's no use pretending, men, <laughs> that you have these pictures there because of the car or the tool in the background. Your wife will probably say otherwise. I, for instance, have nothing personally against beauty pageants. Although I imagine a fair amount of pride and envy are born in beauty pageants. But why exactly are rough men watching beauty pageants? Is it for those save the world speeches at the end? I wonder. You see, the problem is the public acceptance of sin today is at an all time high. It really is. And some of you are much older than me, and you know how this has changed over time. Infidelity and divorce used to be a disgrace so frowned on by society you wouldn't say the word divorce. It's true. Not that long ago. Homosexuality used to be so shameful that it was considered illegal, even in America. Our media, our movies are completely saturated with a whole other idea on sexual immorality. In fact, every movie and TV series, it seems today, has at least one gender-confused person, one homosexual lifestyle, and for sure there's a divorced group living together that aren't married. Almost every show that we watch today. That is the new social norm. But that is not God's norm. Don't let it be yours, Paul says. These are not things we are to do. That is from a previous life, the one that wasn't in Christ. The Bible speaks against premarital sex. If you're not sure about that, the word is fornication. It's all through the Bible. God has a design for marriage, and it's there that these passions are meant to be. And because we have smaller audiences, I will say different words. Against intimacy outside of marriage, the Bible speaks also. 
You are not to do that. Or with the same or confused gender, again, the Bible speaks against these things. And our own imaginations, which is where this all starts, our own hearts. You see, God has designed us. God has designed us male and female so that we would, one day, if it's His will, be joined together and find all of this. It's God's design. He has given us emotions, passions. But we need to conform to His holiness, not the world's. And ladies, if you're feeling left out this morning, <laughs> you may not feel the same strong desire for partially clothed male physiques, but your romance novels have pictures on the fronts of them. And those miniseries about the world turning and guiding lights, and those are something that appeal to you and to the senses of women. But they are also full of idolatry and wrong lifestyles. And one more thing, and by the way, I never know who's showing up on a given Sunday, right? You know that. I can't predict who will be here, so when I write these things down, and by the way, I do write them down in my script, I'm not picking on anybody because I don't know who will be here. Let me say something, though, to the men again. <laughs> when you're watching those Spanish soap operas, it's not because you actually know Spanish. Or you like opera. So Paul is speaking to these things. Not me, Paul. Saying, look, these are from your previous life. All of this is not godly and is from a previous life. In fact, at the end of verse 5, Paul says, And greed, which amounts to idolatry. And this seems a strange addition for Paul. Why does he put greed in here? Well, some translations have the word envy. That word we understand, envy. Paul states that if we indulge in these, we have chosen to worship sin as our idol. That's what idolatry is. We have chosen to place that instead of God. Which is a problem, because if we have stated our belief and our love for Christ, but our actions show us to be an idolatry, that makes us hypocrites. God wrote a long time ago on some stone tablets... The words of Deuteronomy 5.21, You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor desire your neighbor's house, his field, his slave, man and female, his ox, his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. That's difficult, isn't it? If you take the whole list, it's difficult. Because our neighbors have cool things. They got a faster boat. Things that somehow we've been told we need. The Bible says don't envy that. Don't covet that. We ought to love God more than our sinful appetites. Is what Paul wants us to understand. That's the primary objective. We are to set our minds on godly things and turn away from the illicit interests because sin breaks God's commands. All sin. We begin to covet. We begin to be greedy for people and their possessions, things that are not our own. In case you forgot, that led King David into great sin. He saw, he coveted. And once again, women, it led Eve to great sin. She saw, she coveted, and great sin followed. Romans 6, verse 11, instructs believers, count yourselves, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master. Because you are not under the law but under grace. We used to be 
slaves to sin. We are now under the freedom and the love of Christ. Thus, we cannot also do those things. Christ has given us a new life, and the Holy Spirit empowers you and I to be able to live this new life. But clearly, the Bible teaches that we still live in danger of allowing the old sinful habits and desires to come back. The Bible does state, though, the difference between what is right and what is wrong. And for Christians, we are no longer to do what is wrong. Verses 6 and 7, he goes on to say, For because of these things, it's because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon some the sons of disobedience, and in them you also once walked when you were living in them. The Bible talks about sin, right? God establishes what he considers right and wrong. And he has lots of things to say. Do you know that for any of these one sins, God's righteous judgment will condemn someone to hell? Any one of them? Or do you think only the big ones? The really, really big ones. If you don't have the covering of the blood of Christ, all of these and other sins are condemning you to hell. And Paul is not shy about stating that these heart attitudes were something that we all had at some point. Each one of us. None of us, none of us started at the end of the journey. We all started at the beginning. Any sin that we commit against God's holiness is counted as evil, and any is enough to condemn us without the blood of Christ. Many people, I think, believe their sins are okay. They're small, right? Sometimes we even give them names. Well, it's not really a lie. It's a white lie. Apparently, the color matters. If it's a white lie, it's okay. If it's a purple one... You know, there's no such thing. There's truth and there's untruth. In God's eyes. And do you really think you're fooling God? Who can fool God? Or you might think, well, it's a private thing. Nobody knows. It's just a season. It's not a season. You might think, well, it doesn't hurt anybody, so it's okay. Oh, no. When David sinned, and he did sin, when he confessed his sin, who did he confess it to? He said, I have sinned against God. We must be very careful about our sin. Well, there's a very real truth here restated in Romans 1.18 about this wrath. Romans 1.18 says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. There is wrath. Yes, God is complete love, perfect love. Not partial, perfect love. He is all that love could ever be, but he is equally all that holiness and justice will ever be. And sin is wickedness to the Lord. But as those who are saved by Jesus Christ, we are saved from that previous life. And, secondarily, commanded no longer to do those things. That's what the text is. Commanded no longer to do these things. As a Christian, living the same wicked ways we used to live is not an option unless you like breaking God's commands. If you would turn to Ephesians chapter 5 for just a minute. I'd like to read, starting in verse 1, Ephesians chapter 5. And listen carefully to what is expected of true believers. <laughs> It says to believers, be imitators of God as beloved children 
and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. But among you, Christians this morning, among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, he goes on to say, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes upon those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Pretty strong words, I would say. Even stronger when you recognize Paul is writing to a church. Strong words. Well, you may think, well, this, this Ephesian, they had bigger problems because that list is even bigger. It's actually nearly identical in context. And it includes vulgar speech or coarse humor. That's an interesting one. So come back with me to Colossians. And verse 8, but now you also put them all aside. You used to be this way, now be different. Put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Abusive speech, much like the vulgar coarse talking from Ephesians. As those who have accepted Christ's sacrifice were now clothed in Christ's righteousness. That's how we stand. We are not to live with a heart that harbors anger. And if I stopped right there, most of us would have to realize that that speaks to us. At least sometimes. We are not to have a heart that harbors anger Wrath, malice, slander, these are all part of our last lives. And they no longer exist in our new lives. We have a new relationship with Christ. Now, it's a pretty tall order, I would say. And most of us would find ourselves exposed by this. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 37, verse 8, to Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret as it only leads to evil. You ever wonder why you shouldn't be angry all the time? Or let anger take a hold of you? Because it leads to evil. Anger does that. You know that. You've experienced it. See, if it's our lust, if it's our greed, our envy, if they're not fulfilled, how quickly we become angry. Well, I need that. I want that. Why can't I have it? Why do they have it? And if our personal desires are not met, or even if we're walking rightly before the Lord and we're slandered by our enemies how quickly we could allow our anger to take over. And that anger will grow. And suddenly it has intent to exact vengeance and harm others. Anger does that. Well, the psalmist instructs us back in the same psalm in verse 7. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. That's really good advice. Very tough advice. When you see them succeeding in their plans, when you're bypassed, when it doesn't seem like you're on the winning side, be still before the Lord and wait for him. That is why we must learn to be content in the Lord. 
not in our own desires, not in what we think will be right. Because if you're not content in the Lord, your feelings will grow into dangerous anger. The anger will erupt. That's followed with the wrath and the rage. Those are the words. It'll erupt. It'll simmer. It'll get holler, hotter and turn into malice. Well, malice already sounds like a bad word. It doesn't sound like something you'd say to your two-year-old. No. Malice, it, it, it's starting to plot and to devise schemes. Wickedness with a desire to inflict vengeance upon others. That's malice. In fact, in the Greek, I had to look up slander. We know what slander is. It's saying a wrong thing about somebody else. In the Greek, it's interesting. Slander is described as being slow to call something good that is good. And slow to call something evil that is evil. How interesting. It's deceptive. We know it's this, but we don't want to say it is. Slander, of course, ignores what's right and true and looks to injure and discredit another. Well, Paul adds one more unchristian trait that we should not partake of. And we're all different. For some of us, this doesn't affect us at all. This idea of being vulgar, foul, or shameful speaking. There are some people who were never born to speak that way. It's true. I don't know if I was one of them because my parents made me eat a bunch of soap when I was a kid. I remember the bars of zest soap. Um, it works better on the body than in the mouth. Um, if I were to say bad words as a kid, that's what I got. And some of you don't think that way. It's not something you think of talking that way. You don't joke that way. But if you love God, then you won't dishonor him in how you speak. And that's a tough one. It doesn't matter if you were a sailor. It doesn't matter if you're a trucker. Of course, that covers people in here this morning. That wasn't my intent. It doesn't matter where you've worked or where you've grown up. It doesn't. Are you dishonoring God by how you speak? The jokes that you say. I don't have a lot of jokes, if you've noticed. I wasn't blessed with that kind of humor. Um, but that's probably good, because one day I'd probably try to say a not good joke. I just don't have any. Um, sorry. <laughs> but here's something that even Christians do today, and you hear them. They want to suddenly vent a moment, an exclamation point, something happens, they stub their toe, a car runs into the side of them, and all of a sudden, God's name comes out. But not because they're praying or worshiping. It's true. And sometimes it comes out really easily. How about the next time you feel that, you say, Oh, my Buddha. Why don't you pick on something that doesn't actually exist? Try it. See what the people say around you. <laughs> but I would say leave God's name out of these things. And you know what? You can always ask God. If, if, if vulgar language is, is a problem, ask him. Say, look, I, I don't want to speak this way. I don't like speak. It doesn't sound nice. It doesn't make me a cooler person. It's, it's not what honors God. Then ask him. And by the way, if you're super intellectual, find other cool words, really erudite words that you can use in the place of, things that sound very intelligent. And then you won't say the bad words. Okay, you, one of the ways will work. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. You see the difference? I can either be cutting and sarcastic and vulgar, and nobody's built up by it. In fact, usually you're cutting people down with the humor. Or I can say good things. I can build people up around me. That I can do. Verse 9, back in our text, Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. You know, I had to stop when I read this, and I said, oh, what a strange thing for Paul to say to a church, to believers. 
Why would you tell believers not to lie to each other? Do we really have to tell each other that? I have, like others, I have witnessed Christians lying. So Paul has to tell us, don't do that. Don't lie. The Bible also speaks about that in other places, right? We're not to do that. Just be speaking truth. How can we as Christians claim to follow Jesus who is called the truth and then speak lies? Whose father are we then? Do you see? Proverbs 13.5 states that a righteous person hates a false statement, but a wicked person acts shamefully. There are two sides. We need to be on the right side. 10 and 11 go together and have put on the new self who is being renewed. We are to remove our old sinful lifestyles and instead be clothed in Christ. I said that. The Greek uses an interesting present tense here. If you're there in verse 10, present tense. And it's uh, in the Greek, they didn't have capitals and they didn't have bold lettering. So they emphasized by saying things differently. And in this case, it actually says, put on the new one being renewed. How about that? The new one being, constantly, currently being renewed. Well, a double positive is a good thing. You can use that. We are in the process of becoming more Christ-like, each one of us. Just don't slip back on the other side. The same renewal of heart and mind are for all who believe. You see, the ancient believers, and maybe you think this way, the ancient believers weren't more holy or deserving than us. Maybe you think that way. Well, they were, they were different. They, they lived on mountaintops and in caves and they... Messianic Jews today and the strict monks who deny themselves physical pleasures, they're not better clothed in Christ than you are. They're not. That's a wrong idea. We are clothed entirely in Christ as believers. Doesn't matter. That's why he says there in verse 11, it doesn't matter if you're Greek or Jew. The idea is it doesn't matter what country or social status you come from. It doesn't matter. Which is good. <laughs> we have Christ's righteousness as a covering for our sin. And I, you could say it this way. Christ is all yours. And you need to be all Christ's. You have all in Christ. 12 and 14. 12 through 14. I'm sorry. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. Notice he asks you to do something. This is for believers. Now that you are believers, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. In Sunday school this morning, we were talking about these same things, which is always interesting because I'm just working through Colossians, and sometimes the Sunday school matches. Yeah, we need that. We need to hear it. Well, I'm not going to get sidetracked this morning <laughs> into questions about Calvinism because you see the word chosen. Let me tell you this, though. God's character would never allow him to choose salvation for those who didn't want him as their God. And God's character would never refuse those who did want him as their God. You can be sure of that. God has always known all things. Always known all things. He cannot not know something and still be God. That's what it means to be omniscient. So because he has always known all things, God's election and his choosing is in full knowledge of who we are in all of our actions. We are chosen to be his adopted children, much like God chose the Jews. 
though many rebelled against him. Still, they were his chosen. If you want to read this later today for something to do, <laughs> it's very short. Romans 8, 29 and 30. And add 1 Peter 1, verse 2. These speak very clearly about God choosing us based upon his foreknowledge, which, of course, he can't set aside. It's impossible. He can't stop knowing long enough to make a selection. Just read those, Romans 8, 29 to 30, or 1 Peter 1, 2. But what Paul wants to summarize here is that our life should be characterized how it should be characterized as believers. That's what he's interested in. If you are going to be a believer, then you must live as a believer. We are to be holy, to lead holy lives, to have holy thoughts. You can read the same thing, actually, out of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, which says to Christians, to believers, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy, says the Lord. Do you see? That's what we are to be, holy. So instead, this morning, of harboring anger, envy, sexual sin, malice towards one another, we're to let the Holy Spirit develop in us compassion. You see, God's love flowing in us should create this kindness and humility towards others. We can't do it on our own. Everybody tries. We make lists. We go to conferences. We buy books. How to be a loving person. Right? How to develop patience. And it's a thousand pages. It doesn't work. It doesn't. You know. You know from experience. So why don't you do what does work? Why don't you have God help you? Why don't you let that spirit that's now inside actually do its work? And you'll find that if you're less self-focused, you can be more other-focused. Lies, deception, immorality, these are all marks of someone who is self Focused, But with the love of Christ in us, we now seek the best for others, it says, right? What will be the point of compassion and patience and kindness? That isn't for yourself, that's for others. You don't need to worry about uh, coming to church and getting enough at the potluck. Just a thought. No, no, I'm serious. Or if people are being nice to me when I come to church. As a follower of Christ, my heart should be changed and my desires should be changed. So now I'm more interested in, hey, did this person get enough to eat? Or that person looks a little sad today. I wonder what I can do to help them. Not me. I have Christ. Do I need more or can I help others? Gentleness, patience with each other. That's what Paul says we are to have. To be understanding. That means you have to put aside your agendas. Yeah, you might have something at home that's really waiting for you. What about the person who's here right now? That God brought this morning. We need to lift others up. If you stick with self, you're going to want honor and praise. You won't have time for other people. You won't be interested in other people. And then our sinful selves will suddenly not want to forgive other people. Well, Jesus assures us in Luke 18, 7, because if you're worried about justice, right? Well, nobody's paying attention to me, or nobody's giving me this, or I'm not getting what I need. That justice comes from the Lord. Luke 18, 7, will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? Leviticus 19.18, God says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Clear. Stop doing one thing. Start doing the other. And 
When Paul writes to the Roman church, he says in 1219, never take your own revenge. Beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Stop worrying about that. We need to worry about being loving. Because if we don't love God, then we will never love other people. And if you wonder why you don't love other people, maybe. Maybe you haven't loved God yet. Haven't felt His love in your relationship. And let me say something. It seems that many people in church claim to love God, but their actions and their words sometimes seem to show otherwise. Maybe this morning somebody here, and maybe it's more than somebody, still hold anger over some past experience. And maybe it's in another church. In fact, this is a common thread. Books are now being written. If you look on Amazon and Christian Book Distributor, books are being written about how to overcome church hurt. It's a common theme now. Well, if you're here this morning and you think you have suffered in other churches, you're supposed to give that to the Lord. You don't hang on to it because how will you be loving and kind and compassionate and patient with people if all you're hanging on to is, well, I was hurt and this person said that and I'm not going to get over it. Well, let me tell you something about living in the past. If you're living in the past, you can't also live in the present. If you're just, if that's where you are right now, well, the rest of us are here this morning in the present and we're going to have a really hard time connecting with you and you won't see us probably in the way that we really are because you're stuck with something. You have to give that to the Lord. God knows. God will take care of you. God will take care of the hurts. So, instead of doing that, Ephesians 4.32 tells us to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ also forgave you. Scripture expects us to love each other in church because that will be, it says, the perfect bond of peace. It's love. Godly love. So this morning, I ask, may the Holy Spirit hear our cries. May the Holy Spirit heal our pain. May He return joy to our hearts. And may He give us that new spiritual life that is ready to forgive and extend love. Amen.